for us to start the lecture. Uh, welcome to this lecture. And this lecture is about the induction machine, induction motor drive. So this is the last machine drive that we'll discuss in this course. So we started with the DC machine, and then synchronous machine, and then permanent magnet synchronous machine, and the last one is the induction machine. So, so we'll discuss more detail about this induction machine drive and how we can control. So here, in this induction machine drive lecture, what we have, we will discuss the dynamic modeling of the machine. This means the mathematical modeling of the machine and then try to understand which component to control. To have the desired torque, speed, flux. So this is the first part. And then we will discuss the rotor flux oriented control. So you will see there are many different types of control. Uh, this is the rotor flux oriented control. It's one of the one that used a lot in the industry. So we'll discuss more detail about the rotor flux oriented control. And then we'll also talk about the steady state characteristics of the machine, of the induction machine. And finally, we'll discuss the controller design for the induction machine. And the similar control, we mainly apply the PI controller. So that will be our main focus and how we can tune the controller for this uh, induction machine drive. So when we discuss, uh, we focus on this induction machine and we assume the same uh, modeling principle that we assume for the other machine, that is a lossless magnetic energy storage system, where we, we present the losses through this ohmic resistor. This the, if we have the stator coil, then we present the losses in the stator coil through this resistor. And here in the magnetic circuit, the losses in the magnet, uh, rotating part that we lose in the part of the load. So we have this lossless assumption. And in addition, we are also assuming that we are neglecting the magnetic saturation. This means, yeah, how much the stator flux can be. Yeah, it can be infinity that we are in this assumption. But later, it's also possible to consider this uh, saturation in the modeling. But for now, we are assuming that. Uh, is uh, we can have uh, any flux linkage that we want. And then the second assumption is this sinusoidal distribution of the magnetic flux. This is our second assumption that you are assuming. And also you are assuming that is symmetrical winding. This is the third assumption. And the last assumption that you are assuming that the inductance and the resistance, they are temperature independent. So that's our uh, assumption that when we develop the model, and then we come to the model part. So for all the machine, that what we see that, for all the uh, AC machine, when you start with the synchronous generator, uh, synchronous motor, and then uh, later PMSM, primary magnet motor, what we see in this stator, we have three coil in this stator. That's what we see. And in the synchronous, gener synchronous motor, what you see in the field, we have the field winding and the damper winding, and we represent it a bit different way. But what is the difference between this synchronous machine and the induction machine? Uh, for now, we can also say it a synchronous machine. Why you are saying a synchronous machine is that, in the synchronous machine, what you see, the rotor is rotating with the same frequency of the stator, but for the asynchronous machine, the rotor will rotate a bit slower than the uh, speed of the frequency of the stator, uh, stator voltage. So that's why we called it a synchronous machine because it does has a bit different speed, lesser or higher, uh, depending on the application. For motor application, its speed is a bit lower. So what you can see that we have the three stator winding, and also we have three rotor winding, and this winding uh, we can supply them from another converter, like uh, we can have, uh, we can connect them through another converter system, like uh, this. Three of the winding, and then we are supplying from another converter. And the other three, we are, we make them short circuited. So this is one way. And when we supply them through another converter, then we call double fed induction machine. This means we are supplying them through another converter. This is called mainly, uh, that's what we call double fed induction machine. 
And we mainly use this type of machine for wind farm application, wind turbine generator that we use this type of machine. But industry, mainly we'll see this type of machine. What you can see that we have mainly the rotor bar. Yeah, it's uh, circular and we have the rotor bar and all uh, both ends, they are shorted. So if you look at the other figure, then the bar, how they look like, this means they are shorted in one point. Those are shorted in one point, and the other, they are also shorted, like this. So this configuration shorted for this one and their solid bar. And when you have uh, this type of rotor, then we call this a squirrel case induction machine because this looks like a squirrel. So we call it a squirrel case induction machine. So in this uh, lecture, we mainly focus on this one, a squirrel cage. But when you develop the model, and we start with something like this, and then later we present for this one. So what you see, since this is short-circuited, this means the end voltage is here is zero. It's short-circuited in both end. But the other one, if it's double-fed induction machine, then we can supply the router through another converter. That's what we can do. So the first step that uh, what we can do, we have the coil in the uh, stator. So three coil in the stator. Therefore, we have three uh, differential equations that we can write for the three coil in the stator. And we have also three coil in the rotor. And you can write the three equation for the rotor. And when we develop the control, then we always try to represent them in different coordinate system. Like when you have the three equation, and we know that these three voltage, they are 120 degree phase shifted from each other. So what we do, we apply the Clark transformation. This means. If you have anything in ABC format, now you have the three voltage there, uh, ABC, A, B, C, then we convert them into alpha, beta component. Yeah, you can say that alpha, beta, or zero component, three component, alpha, beta, zero. But we neglect the zero because the zero component come initially summation of uh, this three voltage or current, if it's a healthy machine, there is no fault, then the zero component is always zero. So we don't need to focus on the zero component, therefore we only focus on the alpha beta component. So if we have initially uh, this three phase, then now we got them into two phase and we are neglecting uh, the zero component because we are assuming that it's a healthy machine, there is no fault. So you have the alpha beta component. And one thing is to remember is that when it is in ABC, then it's a sinusoidal. The voltage, current, they are in sinusoidal. And when it's in alpha beta, they are still sinusoidal component. But one of them, 90 degree phase shifted from each other, while in ABC, they are 1 to 20 degree phase shifted. So similarly, we can also apply the Clark transformation three phase two, two phase representation. So look at one thing here. They are just bar, right, short circuited. So whether we are presenting in three phase or two phase, that doesn't have any big difference because they are shorted. But for our modeling assumption that we are assuming that they are three phase system like this, and then later we can present them into two phase system. So when is two phase system, then how it look like? Yeah, when it in two-phase system, originally the stator we have the three uh, stator winding. Now we are representing them into two winding. One is the alpha, and another is beta. And this stator winding, they are fixed in their position, so they are fixed. In now these are two fictitious, fictitious winding. Actually, they are not the actual winding. They are fictitious. We got them mathematically applying this transformation. And then similarly, we can also have uh, the similar uh, winding for the rotor. 
So instead of presenting them three-phase system, we are now presenting them into two-phase system, this alpha and the beta component, and there's a 90 degree shifted. So one thing, what you see that, these two, the stator, they are fixed in their position. But what about the rotor? They are now in the alpha beta, but they are rotating. So if you see the voltage and the current there, they will be sinusoidal for the stator, and it's also be the sinusoidal for the rotor because they are in alpha beta co co uh, coordinate system. So what would be the frequency of the rotor, voltage or current? If you look at the voltage and current of the, uh, of the rotor, and what would it be? Let's say the voltage of the stator is 50 hertz. And we say that uh, these are shorted, so they are short-circuited, and the voltage or current will be induced because of the uh, stator flux here when they pass through, yeah, do, through this uh, rotor winding, then they uh, introduce this, bolt, uh, this current there, and now we see it's rotating. And for the synchronous machine modeling, if you remember, then we see that uh, the synchronous machine, if it's 50 hertz, then maybe synchronous machine uh, rotor, uh, as induction machine rotor is rotating with maybe 48 hertz. Then what will be the current there? And it is the difference between these two frequency. So if you see the current, and then it would be here, two hertz in the stator, uh, in the rotor winding. So you'll see that the, in this current or voltage will be two hertz here, the frequency of that. So now one thing that we see, initially we have them in ABC system. Now we got them into alpha beta system. So we have the one alpha component for the stator voltage and one beta component for the stator voltage. And here we have the superscript S to present them in the stator oriented system. Similarly, for the rotor, we have the one alpha component and one beta component, and we are presenting the error R superscript because we are saying that they are rotor-oriented system. And we can also present them like this here, a space vector as a vector there, and where US has a two component, one is the real component, which is US alpha, yeah, it's a state oriented frame, and then J of US beta, and the state oriented frame here. So these two, we can compare in the phasor form like this. Similarly, it also for the rotor. But if you remember for the syn synchronous machine and we present them this term, the rotor in uh, DQ coordinate, DQ, DQ rotating frame. And why we did that? Because we see that in the D-axis we have one type of inductor because we have the less uh, air gap. But in the Q-axis we have the larger air gap, and we have the different D-axis and the Q-axis reactants. But for this induction machine, what you see that we have the uniform air gap. This means we have uh, the reactances, they are same, both because, yes? Can you write the rotor voltage the same way as the stator? Yes, sure. Maybe the yeah, it's the same assumption for the rotor, and then you can write this, which is equal to here. Uh, U R alpha is the R plus J O U R beta and R is the rotor coordinate system. So what we are seeing there, we have the uniform air gap. This means the inductance is the same in the both side. Now we want to look at the inductance, how the inductance look like. So what do you see? First we start with the uh, inductance of the of the stator winding, and you see that we have the self 
uh, inductance of this one, since we have the uniform air gap both sides. So this self-inductance doesn't depend on the position of the rotor because you have the uniform air gap. So you have the position independent self-inductance for the rotor, for the stator. And also if you look at uh, this one, the beta axis, it also has the position independent inductance. So the position independent inductance, that's what we see. And if you also see the uh, mutual inductance between the stator winding, since this flux, they are not passing through each other. So there is no mutual inductance between the stator. So that's what you see. And it's also the same for the rotor. Because you have the uniform uh, air gap all the side. So you'll see that uh, the, uh, the rotor self-inductance is, uh, self is the in uh, position independence. And the mutual inductance between the stator, they are zero. So that's what we get. If we look at, yeah, I think that Roy discussed very well how you got this. Since uh, now we see that the self-inductance of the stator, they are position independent. And the mutual inductance between the stator, they are zero. Yeah, because the flux of the one stator winding is not going through the another one. Therefore, we got it zero. And we got the similar for the rotor part. But since the rotor is rotating, and we see that if you look at the previous figure here, and this rotor is rotating. Since the rotor is rotating, so we see that the mutual inductance between the stator and the rotor is de uh, they are depend they depends on the position. So therefore, we can write them position dependent uh, mutual inductance between the stator and the rotor. Therefore, we got this matrix. So I'll not discuss in detail about this. It's just for you to know that uh, how we got this matrix. And then so once we got this matrix, and we know that uh, uh, the torque of the machine, the mechanical torque, yes? Uh, I think that's just only for your understanding. So we might not ask you to derive that matrix or you don't need to do. But later, we will not use that matrix. We'll use another simplified form of the matrix in the modeling part. But this is the basic physics that how it comes. So that's why you start with that one. So once you have this uh, inductance matrix, then we know that this concept of the co-energy from this concept of co-energy, it's a position dependence inductance that give us the torque. And then we got the uh, mechanical equation of the machine. Yeah, here this is the pole pair. How many pole, poles here? And if you look at the derivative part of the inductor, and you see that uh, this part is the, it's not position dependent, therefore we got it zero but only the mutual inductance between the, um, the stator and the rotor, they are position dependent, therefore we got these two terms, the rest of them, we got zero. So now we have the basic understanding of the, of the machine. So this is, that's what I discussed, it's just the basic, uh, basic machine, induction machine, that's what you will see. So now we start with the modeling part for the control. So first we have to derive the analytical model of all the voltage and the current equation and all this thing, torque equation. So let's start with that. And one thing here, what we see, first I want to start here that we have the stator winding, is the alpha and the beta, a stator, and also rotor has one alpha and the beta. And the stator, they are alpha as a quantity, and they are fixed in their position. And the rotor, they are also alpha beta, this means as a quantity, but it's rotating. So when it's rotating, we try to, we try to make them like same orientation. Either we can do the inductor, uh, stator in the same axis of the rotor, 
like one way we can fix, we can try to uh, have the stator winding the same axis as the rotor, like uh, here. This is the one way that we can do that. That's what we call the rotor orientation. This means rotor is rotating. It is the same as speed. A stator also rotating. Then it's called the rotor orientation. This is the one way, rotor orientation. And then another way is that we fix the rotor in the stator coordinate system. So now, before these two rotating, now we change them such a way that in the modeling, that they are fixed with respect to the stator. So now we have them there uh, fixed in their position, we, even though rotor is rotating, but we change the uh, math, mathematical models as well that they look fixed in their position with respect to uh, with respect to stator. Then we call them a stator oriented uh, modeling or a stator orientation. So we can have them, and if it's a stator orientation, then how they look like? You can see this is the first equation. For the stator. And here we have the stator orientation, therefore we have S here. Now, before the rotor, and we have them rotor orientation, now we change them to stator orientation, therefore we put them S here for the rotor equation, and we have an additional term there. So you can see this is the additional term comes here, this additional term. And it's because we represent them, we change them rotor orientation to a state of orientation. Therefore, we got this additional term. And now we have this flux also, a stator flux, and the rotor flux, all of them in a stator coordinate system. So we got this one extra term. When we have converted them to uh, a stator uh, rotor orientation to a state of orientation, then you got this term, and if you want to write the simply how it comes, uh, it's from rotating to fixed stationary position, that's what we bring. This means initially in rotating frame, it was derivative term, DDT. Now we got, we replace them with uh, DDT minus J of omega R, something like that, we replace them. So initially, it was in rotor coordinate. Now we convert them into a stator coordinate, and then we got this term. So how it comes, you can look at to this transformation here. So we have here three axes. The first one is to represent the stator coordinate system. And the second one, rotor-oriented system. So you have these two orientation here. And if you look at the phase information between these two, here you have the phase between the stator and the rotor, which is theta here. And if you look at the transformation matrix for this theta, yeah, if you remember, if you want to convert anything from a stator to rotor or rotor to a stator, then it was the matrix, uh, if you remember, something like this, which is cos of theta, sine of theta, and minus sine of theta, and cos of theta. So this matrix we only used for transformation from uh, rotor to a stator, because we have the angle between this, and then when we convert from rotor to a stator, then we have this matrix. We are applying this matrix, and this is the face information that we have. So that is the one thing that we can do. But here, what we are saying that these two, uh, these two orientation is the stator or the rotor. They give us sinusoidal quantities. But when we design the machine, we usually try to have a look the machine software that it look like a DC machine. This means all the voltage and the current, they should look like, look like DC quantities. So if we want to convert them into DC quantities, then we try to find an, another 
coordinate system. Here we are calling them this one, alpha k. Yeah, maybe later you can say you can say also maybe d k or something like that, uh, d or q. You can say also maybe later DQ, but for now we are saying that this is alpha k, a new coordinate system that now we are using for new orientation. So why we are doing that? Because we say that if we convert uh, alpha, uh, a state of orientation to a rotor orientation, they are still all of them in DC, uh, AC quantities. Again, if we convert them, uh, rooted to all of them to a stator orientation, they are still AC quantities. So we try to find something, another orientation, let's say it's alpha k, and this alpha, these two are fixed, but this one, we will see that it will all be rotate the same speed of the fundamental frequency or the stator frequency. Then if, it, if this uh, orientation, this vector rotate, then we will see that the voltage and the current, they will be AC, uh, DC quantities. Therefore, we will convert both stator and the rotor into new coordinate system. So if you convert them into new coordinate system, then how it looked like? And you can see that here we have the phase difference between stator and the, and the new coordinate system, which is theta k here. So we apply this theta k for the first, uh, uh, first rotation, first conversion, because this is the angle here. Now we have the theta k. So you got the first uh, transformation matrix, and also you have the same inverse transformation matrix. We can also convert from here to here, applying the inverse transformation matrix. And then we also want to convert the rotor also in the same coordinate system. Then you have the phase information, which is theta r. Then if you apply this theta R, then we got this transformation matrix here. And then now both the stator and the rotor voltage, before, if you look at here, the voltage here, it was uh, UR, R, stator orientation. And then it was here, US, stator orientation. And now when both of them converted to here, then we can write is a KX6 then USK, then URK, because we have the new orientation, which is the K orientation, this direction. Before it was the S, state orientation. Here, rotor voltage is the rotor orientation. Now, both of them, we converted to this new axis here, alpha K. Then the stator voltage would be K here, and the rotor voltage would be K, because now they are oriented to uh, this axis here. So if they are orientation in that axis, then the, we got the new total matrix like this, and the inverse like this. Any question here? What is the difference between the two uh, sort of H minus K? You said is that for the other, uh, the other uh, X uh, reference axis? Sorry, I, I didn't. Oh yeah, this one yeah. is the inverse of this one, inverse mat transformation matrix. Okay. So this means if you have anything here, then if you apply this matrix, then you are getting here. And But if you want to get it back to this axis, then you apply this inverse transformation matrix. So now we have this matrix, and then if you look at how it comes, yeah, maybe I will not discuss in detail. I can present the result in one, what is coming. When you are applying this inverse, then you are getting some extra component here. Either it is uh, uh, a stator voltage or the rotor voltage. Then when you are applying this, then you are getting this extra term here. One is for the, uh, the frequency of the near coordinate system and one is the rotor uh, coordinate system, uh, rotor frequency. So I want to show the resultant, uh, resultant one. 
in the new coordinate system. So now in the new coordinate system, what you get, you have the stator voltage in the new coordinate system. Now we have the current, stator current in the new coordinate system. So this is what we have the originally in the equation. Because of the new coordinate system, we got this term for the stator. And for the rotor, what we are getting, we have this original term in the rotor, and we got this additional term here. And this FR, we have this FR, and the FR is this. So what you see, this N, this is the speed of the rotor. When you supply in the stator, then uh, rotor is rotating with this speed, and it's in per unit. And this is the speed for the new coordinate system. And then if you look at the current induced in the rotor, and this is the frequency uh, of the induced current in the rotor. FK, if you look at the, yeah, here uh, we have the alpha K, this alpha K, and if we say there's this alpha K rotate with the FK speed, and that is the FK of that one. So it's rotating with the alpha K, uh, FK, the new coordinate system. Now, here we have the, this new equation, and this is because we are converting them into, uh, into new coordinate system. So here, I want to say one thing, what we did here. We have initially everything in alpha S here. It's alpha S and beta S here. And then we have the stator one. This, uh, the rotor one, which is alpha R. And then we have the beta R here. So in the first, what we did, this alpha, we first convert it into a stator coordinate. So we first, this converted into a stator coordinate, therefore we got this minus n part. When it comes to a stator coordinate, therefore, since it's, the angle is minus here, therefore we got this minus n. And then again, what we did, we converted into new coordinate system. This is the alpha k. And then beta k here. So first we have the alpha s as it is, and then alpha r, the rotor orientation, then we convert it into uh, the stator one, and then we, all of them convert it into new coordinate system. So we can see in the new coordinate system, what would be the value of fk here? Yeah, if this angle between uh, alpha s and the alpha k is zero, the angle, this means this frequency is zero. This is the theta k. Here, this is theta k here, right? That's what we defined previously. If theta k is zero, and then d theta k over dt, which is the fk, this is zero, right? So we are getting this zero because then it's converting to, it's coming to this axis. Therefore, we get it zero. Then what would be the quantities here? This fk is zero there, fk zero, and fk zero. So this is original quantity in a stator orientation. But when, if we put it fk is equals to like uh, something like this, fk, which is the fundamental frequency, at omega one, you can say that this means this vector is rotating with the fundamental frequency or the stator frequency, uh, omega one. Then you will have it here, omega one. Then you also have the here, fr, which is omega one minus n. 
omega 1 minus n, you are getting here this fr like this. And here you are getting this is omega 1. This means now the when it rotates with a frequency of f1, then you are getting this in the DC quantity. Is it not clear? Maybe it's a bit still confusing. So one thing, what I'm saying that when they are in the stator orientation, they are still a C. When they are in the rotor orientation, they are still uh, a C. But in the new coordinate system, and if we select this alpha k, new coordinate, and which rotate with the speed of f1, then we got all of them to DC quantity. And now the question is how to select this alpha k? And what would be the value of this angle theta k? So that is the question that how to select uh, this alpha k. And later I will show you that we will select this one is the uh, rotor flux orientation. This means we put here rotor flux. This is the rotor flux orientation. If we put it the rotor flux, and this rotor fl flux, this is one of the space vector which rotate with the frequency of f1 or fs, a stator frequency, then we will see that they become the DC quantity and we will use that model for control implementation. So now we have our basic model, the basic equation that now we have and we can use, uh, we can use them for further work. Any question up to here? Is it still very complex? Yes? Yes, yeah. that is the main reason that we want to see that the model should look like a, uh, like a DC, DC machine, all the variables like a DC variables. So that is the main reason why we are trying to find the new coordinate, the alpha k coordinate. Because if we present everything in the stator coordinate, they are still SE, alpha beta. Rotor coordinate, they are still alpha beta, the SE. So therefore, we need to find a new coordinate system. That's for now, we are saying is the alpha k. We don't know what is alpha k yet, which coordinate. But alpha k, that we can select alpha k such way that that give us a that give us the DC quantity of the voltage and the current, all this thing. So that is the main reason why we are looking for a new coordinate system. And later we will see that this new coordinate system will orient it with a rotor flux. So we'll try to find the rotor flux. This is the CR, rotor flux. And then the orientation would be in the rotor flux. And also you see that the rotor flux rotate with a, with a frequency f of fx, fs. This means it's rotating. When it's rotate, this means you are getting DC quantities. So now we have the model. So once we have the model, then we do some more tricks to make it uh, uh, better usable the model that we have, since uh, we only, we can measure the quantity from the stator winding. We can measure the stator voltage, a stator current, but we cannot measure anything from the rotor, right? Since, yeah, it's there. And we cannot measure the voltage and the current. If we want to measure, we can, but that's not a straightforward because it's rotating and sophisticated. So we do some tricks with the uh, rotor quantities so that we can have the better, uh, nicer model. So what we do there to have the nicer model, we can do some simplification here, like uh, what you see, we have the stator, uh, stator reactants, then we can present the stator reactants, just like uh, mutual reactants, plus some parts of the mutual reactants. And we defined another variable there, sigma s here for the stator part, sigma s. So this means we have the mutual inductance plus some part of the, yeah, this is the leakage reactance that uh, through the air gap. And this part, we can also say that the, we can write is some sorts of the 
uh, some part of the mutual reactants. That's what we can write. And similarly, we can also write for the stator one, uh, rotor one, and then we can write this like this. Uh, we can present the sigma r there. And we will use them later for uh, another application when we do the simplification. And another thing, uh, when we represent the model, and we will represent the models as a way that we will only have the uh, stator current as a state variable and the rotor flux as a state variable. So these two, we will present them as a state variable in the equation. But if you look at in the previous equation that we already have already developed, and you'll see that we have two state variables, which is the uh, rotor flux, stator flux, and the rotor flux. These are the two state variables, two differential equations now we have. But in the later, when you develop the model, we will develop the model so that we will present only the stator current as a state variable, and then rotor flux is a state variable. So in order to present the rotor, uh, rotor current as a state variable, what we need to do, we need to replace this stator flux is in this equation. So you can replace this part. And then we want to remove this variable also, uh, uh, rotor current. And then from this one, we can write the uh, uh, IR current like this here. So we will replace this IR current so that we can have the stator flux, uh, rotor flux as a variable there and the stator current as a variable. And also we replace this stator flux here so that we can, we can have the uh, stator current and the rotor flux as the state variables. And we have defined some other variable like uh, you can see we have this Shy R. Uh, before we have it like only a small R here. Now we are presenting here is capital R, and then when you multiply with this term, then you are changing to this variable. So instead of a small R, we are putting it capital R here, and we have another term. I will discuss this part a bit later how we get uh, this and why, you are, why we need this simplification. I'll come back to this later. So I, I don't think I need to discuss the choice of the base values. That's what we have already discussed in the stator, uh, in the synchronous machine. We will follow the similar principle uh, to select the base value the basis for power unit. Like you can see here, we have the voltage divided by frequency that give us flux. That's how we can write the nominal flux. And you'll see this value, the peak value in the nameplate. That's how we can get. So later, we'll apply this transformation, this transformation, and when you apply this transformation, and you'll see that the final matrix that we get is like this one. For the, initially you have the inductor, inductance matrix, and then they're in power unit, so inductance uh, multiply with the power unit frequency, they give us the same as the reactance, so you can write the same reactance matrix here, and when you apply this transformation, then we see they uh, become like this. And we have the self-inductance, self-reactance, and the mutual reactance. So only this term. So I think before starting the next lecture, we have uh, a couple of seconds. For, uh, if you have any questions before I start the second part of the lecture, if you have any questions, just uh, you can take it now. the part that I discussed in the first part and any question? Yes? Is it possible to do an example of this uh, on numerical pressure? Uh, example of numerical example or? Yeah, like we have not have so many examples during the course so it would have been nice to 
Okay, yeah. I'll try to have something like this, but when we derive this, we don't actually have this numerical example.